time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, I want to tell you a small story here. Um, if you notice, for the last few weeks, I have been coughing um, ever so often, and it sounds like I have a chronic cough. Um, that's not the case. I still have this obstruction in my neck, and um, when I cough, it sort of opens my airways, and, uh, and then I get air so I can talk to you some more. Now, what does my throat have to do with today's show? Well, I'm going to tell you. Um, a few months ago, I was sent to uh, the University of Washington, and on the way there, my friend that drove me, we um, stopped at this doctor's office, and um, uh, she had something to do there. So I got bored, and I was reading these pieces of paper and flyers and things. And uh, in a roundabout way, um, uh, it, well, it, eventually I called the number. You know, being who I am, I was a little nosy, and I wanted to know more about these things. And eventually, I met these two wonderful friends that um, you have also met. Patricia, uh, Michael, and um, Tom Stahl, and um, we did the uh, Fully Informed Jury um, show and also um, slave, labor, slave Labor in America. And um, as the story goes, um, one of the friends that I got introduced to as a result of all of that is my guest today, and his name is Larry Dodge. So how are you, Larry Dodge? Fine, thank you, Lillian. How are you? I'm fine other than my coughing here. But isn't it amazing when a person is in your circle how you're going to end up where you're going to end up anyway? One thing leads to another, one person leads to several others. It really does, you know. So uh, what we want to do today, I want to introduce you to the friend um, as Larry Dodge, the person, and then you have promised to come back as another, at another time and talk about what you do when you put on your other hat. So I'm going to um, sort of turn it over to you for a minute here. You can start wherever you like. Um, childhood, how long it took you to get 21, if you like. <laughs> and I think it took me 21 years to 21 get to 21. Years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And wherever you want to pick that up um, in your life where things started to fall in place with you, and that's where we'll start, I think. Well, the story of my life, that's a very interesting topic, at least to me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's to me too, so <laughs> that, that's why we're here. Well, let me, let me say something first. You did come from Wyoming. Wyoming is my most recent home, mm -hmm. although I was born in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were professionals. My father was a dentist mm -hmm. and my mother a nurse. And they chose to not to expose me to the rigors of city life. And dad wanted to open a practice in a smaller community than Oakland, mm -hmm. even though that's where my mother worked. So promptly upon being born, uh, I moved with my mom and dad back to a little town called Martinez, which is about a half an hour away from Oakland mm -hmm. uh, in the Bay Area. And lived there and, and uh, other than a few moves that my parents made here and there uh, until uh, I graduated from high school, which was, I hate to confess it, 1960. We just celebrated uh, a, f a 40th class reunion. Class reunion. Things change, don't they? Uh, yeah, we were yeah. all getting a little bit fatter and grayer and more yeah. wrinkled up, and it was pretty interesting, but yeah. a delight to meet my yeah. Alhambra High School classmates again mm -hmm. just this past summer. Um, in high school, I, uh, I uh, prepared for college. I was mm -hmm. a college preparatory student, although I'm sure like most people, I had no idea what that meant. I just took what they said were prerequisite courses. You will want this. You will need that. Yeah. So I took the math and the English and the science courses. Uh, I wish I'd taken more <laughs> shop courses, as it turns mm -hmm. out. I like to work with my hands, but I didn't really know it then. And then, uh, after some serious uh, uh, coin flipping, I should say, first of all, the, the big clue to getting me into the livelihood that I eventually chose was the big starting point was when my dad took me to Idaho and Montana on fishing mm -hmm. trips when I was a teenager. You know, mom would get tired of us, and she'd run us out of the house and uh, the best way yeah, to do that, grab yeah. a pool and, and mm -hmm. take the car and go up to Montana or Wyoming or Idaho and, yeah. and try to catch some trout. 
I don't know what it was about the Rocky Mountains. I mean, California has beautiful mountains, but when I got to the Rockies, I just felt good. Like, this the, is where I belong. The air is different. There's something about it. It's yeah. the people, it's the air, yeah. it's, it's the wide open spaces. You know, they call Montana the big sky country. That's right. And you, as the show announced at the very beginning, uh, the, the idea of big sky is incorporated into my business name, Big Sky Magic, yeah. because it is magic. There, there's beautiful sunsets and puffy mm -hmm. little clouds and sunbeams, and, uh, and, but the breadth of the sky in Montana is the magic. It is, yeah. I, I drove through there um, a couple of years ago in my, my RV, in my old RV, and, and, and people said, oh, you'll never get out of Montana. <laughs> That's but, a big place. But I did Montana easier than I did Texas, you know. Like that. Texas is even bigger, yeah. but it, there's something about Montana that gives the illusion of a very large yeah. playing field, a very large sky. I've often speculated about what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's the wide valleys with the distant peaks mm -hmm. gives it the impression of space with a rim around it, like you're in a bowl Just wonderful, with jagged yeah. edges, whatever it is. It's, it captivated me to be in that part of the country as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so when it came time to go to college, that's where I chose to go. I applied only to Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. So did you, did you um, choose what you wanted to, or did it fall in place for you? You mean as a major in college? Was you kind of maneuvered there? A little of both. I mean, it's hard to say on something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I knew that if I was going to go to college anyway, I might as well go in an environment that I liked. Yeah. So I chose Montana of the three. Mm -hmm. Although I'd never been to Missoula, Montana, I stepped out of the Northern Pacific train at 5.18 in the morning in early September 1961 and just looked around and I knew I was home. Wonderful, yeah. Going with the flow here. Yeah. Went with the flow. Yeah. I stayed at the University of Montana for the full four years, mm -hmm. got my degree and, and then went back to Rhode Island mm -hmm. to do my graduate training at Brown University. And my whole time on the East Coast, I was a fish out of water. I, I was supposed to be in Montana. I knew yeah. I was going home, and I actually quit my graduate training and went back to Montana once. Really loved it, but discovered that with a minor degree, that is a master's degree, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't make the grade in the sociology department at, at the University of Montana as a teacher. I would need the PhD. So I went back to Brown and finished mm -hmm. it up taught for one near year in New York and could hardly wait uh, to saddle up and go back home. Back to open spaces, yeah. And moved right, right near Missoula again. Mm -hmm. uh, Western Montana is such a charming place. And, but then uh, the more interesting part of that story is after a few years of teaching at the university, it began to wear thin. Yeah. Uh, the politics of, of teaching at a, at a college, you mm -hmm. know, were heavy. You know, there was lots of pressure behind the scenes to publish, to play political games. There were union organizing in, uh, among the faculty. Uh, there was uh, uh, a lot of attention to uh, getting more students to attend mm -hmm. the campus, but not by making the college curriculum more attractive, but yeah. by making more courses mandatory. Mm -hmm. and. I felt that more and more time was being spent in faculty meetings deciding mm -hmm. the politics than it was being spent in the classroom teaching the kids, mm -hmm. teaching the students. I, didn't, I got to where I didn't like my chosen career. Mm -hmm. And at about the same time, at a local drugstore in Missoula, the lady who runs the drugstore was looking at my slides that I would have developed, my photographic slides that I would have developed at her drugstore. Mm -hmm. Every time I'd get into town to see, uh, you know, to pick up my slides, I'd find that the package had already been opened and she'd been into it and she'd been holding the slides up to the light and she says, oh, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. I want to make a picture yeah. of this one to hang in my store over in this corner and I want an enlargement of that one to, to hang in this corner. And finally she said, Larry, why don't you, why don't you start a postcard company? Mm -hmm. I have to deal with a postcard supplier that I don't like. I think he cheats me in the quantity that he says mm -hmm. he puts in. It's hard to keep up with what he says he does and what's really true. And his pictures aren't that great, and he's kind of a, an irritating fellow to do business with. Mm -hmm. Why don't you do it? Well, of course, I didn't have the money. 
Yeah, lady was pretty persistent. She stayed after me for, uh, uh, her, na her name was Dooling, um, I think it was Margaret Dooling, but in any case, she stayed on my case. Margaret's are very persistent. Margaret's are persistent, <laughs> this is it, see. Yeah. She stayed on my case for several months, and then I got a notification in the mail that I'd won a writing contest that I had entered a year before. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was <coughs> $2,500 richer. That's right. So I said, this is my chance. Mm -hmm. So I spent all the money making it into postcards and display racks. Mm -hmm. And by midsummer 1971, mm -hmm. I was out on making my way from restaurant to campground to convenience mm -hmm. mart to drugstore all over western Montana with a station wagon full of postcards. Wonderful. Now, be, be, before we go into your photographs and everything, when uh, we had to chase you all over the country trying to get you to come here, if you remember, um, called your secretary and she said she had put out an APB on you because you, <laughs> you just went, you know, we just kept missing you. But when I did talk to you, you told, um, um, you told an interesting story that I really think is worth sharing with the friends here. Sure. Um, to refresh your memory, um, it, you kept talking about Seattle, and I was trying to explain to you where Olympia, Washington is. That's where we taped the shows for the friends around the country. And I was trying to tell you where Olympia was, and then you said that you wrote a letter to the Supreme Court here. To the Temple of Justice. To the Temple of Justice, that's Which right. I thought was one of the most ostentatious titles I'd ever heard for mm -hmm. a courthouse. Mm -hmm. But that's where the Supreme Court of the state of Washington meets, and today I had the pleasure of being shown this building. You got to see it today. I got mm -hmm. to see it, and it's just as ostentatious as I thought. I, yeah. I'm not sure if the quality of justice there is any greater than it is in a JP court held in a mobile home in Drummond, Montana. Yeah. But the weather was good. But the weather was good, <laughs> and, the, and the building was impressive. It was impressive, yeah. <laughs> and, and so during that conversation, um, then, then you was telling me an indirect story. You had another very strange, this is the person of high strangeness here. You had another very, um, there was another connection to Olympia, to Olympia, Washington, and I would like to share that. So you tell your part of it, and then and I'll fill in the blank cells up. I'll tell you mine, you tell me yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, this is something you've done some research on, I know. Yeah, two weeks. Yeah. Well, no, 10 days, however. This is while I was going to the University of Montana, before I went to Brown, before I started the postcard, the Big Sky Magic mm -hmm. Postcard Company. I was angry at a, an English professor who had given me a very poor grade, a D to be exact, during my freshman year in an English composition class at the University of Montana. English has been, or had been then, my best subject. Mm -hmm. And to be very honest with you, I did mind. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Better than my English. <laughs> uh, well, it's something I liked, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I had very good English teachers. Mm -hmm. And when you like a subject and you have good teachers and, and everything, it's easy. I got a really lousy grade, and I knew it was because of a personality conflict with the professor. Mm -hmm. The reason I knew this is because, unbeknown to him, unbeknown to practically anyone, uh, I, in order to finance my way through uh, one of my years of college there, one of my early years of college at the uh, University of Montana, i have been helping my, uh, my fraternity brothers write papers mm -hmm. in the English class, in the same class. They were getting A's and B's. You got a D. I would get a C or yeah. a D on the same paper, yeah. basically the same paper. In fact, of course, I always saved the best paper for myself, mm, and still I would get a D. Yeah. And I knew it was because he and I had gotten into a shouting match one time in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We did not like each other, and this was his way of getting even. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to go tell the dean. You know, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't do that now, but in those days, I was yeah, willing to take changed, my problem yeah. to a higher authority yeah. and have it settled if I could. So I went to see the dean of, of men, or the dean of the liberal arts college, mm -hmm. uh, and I did it as soon as I got my, my grade report by mail which, of course, was during the break between quarters, between the winter and spring quarter, uh, 1962. I got there only to find that the dean had fled the campus on a week or 10-day vacation to he take advantage of the, of the break. <laughs> he maybe did. Maybe, maybe uh, he anticipated it. Yeah. 
But, uh, and his secretary had also been given the time off, so all they had in the entire dean's office was one person, a lady uh, who was subbing in, as a, she was a temporary secretary. Mm -hmm. And her basic job was to tell everybody that showed up, sorry, uh, the dean will be back you yeah. know, in April or something, um, I'll take your name and number, or yeah. you, let me write a note regarding your business and I'll tell him when he returns. Now, I'm a total unknown on this campus. I've only been there for two quarters. Mm -hmm. And other than a few fraternity brothers and a, a, a wife that I had just married uh, uh, maybe six or seven weeks earlier, nobody knew me. But this lady did. She looked up at me when I walked into the dean's office and she said, you're Larry Dodge. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, yeah, yes, I am, but how could you possibly know that? Oh, she says, that's easy. She said, your brother was just in here five minutes ago to try to see the dean and he wanted to get a permit to sell sleep learning devices and he represented a company called Olympic Sleep Learning Devices uh, based in Olympia, Washington. Olympia, Washington. Mm -hmm. And he said that he didn't know exactly how to find you right off the bat but he said that I would recognize you if I ever saw you because he and you look just alike except mm -hmm. that he has blonde hair and blue eyes and you have the brown hair and brown eyes. Otherwise, he's a little shorter than you, but the faces are identical. Yeah. And I said, my goodness. Of course, immediately my own mind harks back to the, a tragedy in our family that occurred in 1945 when my older brother died in a swimming accident. He, was, he drowned in a swimming pool at a local golf course in Martinez, California. Yeah. He was blonde. He was blue-eyed. He would have been a little shorter to me according to the measurements that mothers always Mother's make of children trick, yeah. at certain ages. And he was four years older than I. This lady, who I never, I never saw her before, was sitting there telling me that my brother was four years older than me, had blonde hair, blue eyes. Nobody knew about my brother. Yeah, and he, he, she also knew um, about your, your marriage and everything, she, right? She knew about my marriage, <laughs> my, she knew my grades, she knew I was living in Missoula, she knew all sorts of things about yeah. me, none of which was reported. Now, just for an example, at the University of Montana, if you get married as a student, your wife is entitled to an ID card so That's she right, can go yeah. to the games and use the library, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. I hadn't even bothered to do that, so the, even the yeah. registrar at the campus had no record of that I was That's married. Wife, you had yeah. to know me and my family yeah. or do some research, some serious research. Yeah. I mean, my fraternity brothers knew a few things about me, but they didn't know about my brother. Yeah. My wife hardly even knew about my brother. This is something that happened Many years ago, 18 yeah. years before or something. I, didn't, I hardly even remembered it myself, but here I am confronted with this as though my, my brother had come back to life. Well, I said, what was his name? She said, Marcellus Dodge. And I went, well, that's different. My real brother was named Ronald. Mm -hmm. So I called my mother that day and I said, Mom, was Ronnie's name Ronald Marcellus perchance? To see if the. Yeah, says, that, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to know if the, if the yeah. Marcellus was in the family tree someplace. Yeah. No sign of him. She'd never heard of him. Nobody in the family knew anything about it. So I just let it ride. The next day, I was in the. Lodge, uh, which is the student union building at the University of Montana, mm -hmm. and I went down to get a cup of coffee between classes. And I wouldn't say it's the next day, it was the, the day after classes yeah. resumed. I went down for a cup of coffee between classes, and here's this woman again. Of course, mm -hmm. by now I had a whole bunch more questions for her. I wanted to know more That's about right. Olympic yeah. sleep learning devices, maybe get some phone numbers, addresses, this kind of thing. So I was looking forward to talking to her again. And there she sat alone at one of these little Booth. little coffee tables yeah. in the lodge. And I thought, oh, this is a perfect opportunity to sit down and continue our discussion. So I came up with my cup of coffee, and I looked at her, and I said, uh, hi, do you mind if I sit down and we continue our conversation? And she looked up at me, and she says, I don't know who you are. I've never seen you before in my life, and I certainly don't want any company yeah. At my at my table, uh, please leave me alone. Yeah. So I, it was really an embarrassing situation. Here's somebody I'd spoken with three days earlier who'd talked to me for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. giving me the whole details of my life and my family. In detail, yeah. And now she says right. she's never seen me before and doesn't know me and doesn't want to talk to me. Yeah. So of course I did what you would do. I walked away. 
And it wasn't until about five years later mm -hmm. that anything relating to this incident ever occurred again. Mm -hmm. And that was when I had gone to Brown University. I told you earlier on, I came back from Brown came after back, a couple yeah. of years because mm -hmm. I needed to be back home in Montana. And then I returned to Brown to finish up the, the degree kind of with my teeth gritted yeah. to get this job done I'd started. And uh, the students I'd entered the graduate school there at the sociology department at Brown thought, oh, good, Dodge is back. Well, it's a great excuse to have a party. Yeah. We'll introduce him to all the new students. So I, uh, I said, great. And uh, so we had this party where all the new graduate students who'd come in during the year I was gone were invited so that we could you know, make these introductions and proceed. And one of them was a student from Columbia who, after a few minutes of conversation, just popped out with this remark. He said, you know, he says, uh, 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 they're in New York, you know, he says, I was going to Columbia University, and he said, that's where I met the only Dodge, besides you, mm -hmm. that I've ever encountered. He says, you never heard of a guy named Marcellus Dodge, have you? And my jaw dropped. Yeah, dad was again, yeah. yeah. Ordinarily, when you meet a stranger, you say, oh, you're from the East Coast? Oh, I'm from the East Coast, too. Yeah. Where did you live? New York? Oh, in New York? Well, so did I. Did you live in Brooklyn, or did you live in, yeah. you know, you finally narrow it down to the town, and finally, the last question after several questions is, did you ever know so-and-so? So-and-so, yeah. And here it's his first question. First question, Did yeah. you ever hear of Marcellus Dodge? I said, yeah, uh, tell me about it. So I told him the story I just told you. That's right. And he told me the story that Marcellus Dodge was this kind of mysterious guy with long, scraggly gray hair who played the guru role mm -hmm. on the Columbia University campus and went around with a bunch of disciples. And they kind of lurked about the campus, and nobody really knew what they were up to. What they were up to, yeah. And I could tell you more of the story, but it looks like uh, I'm back but in we Olympia. Only have an hour. What's, no, I know, I can't to... tell at all. I'm no, back here in Olympia, well, and I'm going to keep up the research. Now, you told me right, you had okay. some news. So as, he tell, as Larry tells me the story, um, I perceived him to be a very practical, logical person, you know? And so I was really excited about this story. So I said, oh, I'm just going to surprise him when he gets here. So in the 60s, to have a company of that nature would have been, um, I've been here since 67, they would have been so out of the ordinary that people would have noticed it, thought it was the occult or totally crazy to, to make a device where you put a tape of some sort in it, lay it under your pillow with French in it, and you wake up and you know how French. And so we said, uh, I kind of set out to find this company. And of course, I called it newspaper and everything. And, um, and they advised me that they archived their records prior to 1965. Some of it went to the museum at Lacey, and some of it went to other places. Well, I couldn't really get anywhere to have a written trail of the company. Um, we have a restaurant in town. It's called the Spa. It's been here, you know, forever. So I called the bartender, and I said, I want to talk to the oldest person you got sitting at your bar, and, um, and ask him. And of course, several people had heard of it. But because I wanted to prove this to you, I said, well, this is not good enough for me. So I called all the Dodgers in the phone book. And I was halfway through, and I thought, oh, with all the telemarketers, I better call the station in case they want to verify why I'm asking all these questions. And, um, and I did that. And I ended up talking to a lady named Jan Dodge. And um, <coughs> I don't want to misquote her here, but she told me that her husband was an anthropologist. and. Um, and she researched, um, much like your wife, what do you call that when you research names? Genealogy. Ge yeah, she was in genealogy. And she did just that. And um, that they found, we, we couldn't locate Marcellus, but they found a plaque on the, what is now the west side of a Vandolph Dodge. And nobody seems to know what that plaque is for. So if anybody in the area has ever heard of Vandolph Dodge even, but you called the, uh, the show, and maybe we can, you know, continue to um, to maybe get to the bottom of that where we can, you know, with a paper trail. But the other interesting thing was that um, she had also heard of this company before, and some of the people in the Unitarian Church. So we did get as far as yes, this company did originate in Olympia, Washington. So that's better than nothing, you know. 
It is. It's a lot better than nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, as you mm -hmm. intimated, uh, is into genealogy, and so every once in a while we make a pilgrimage mm -hmm. uh, to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, where the Mormons mm -hmm. retain records of practically, they got the best genealogical records in the world, no yeah. question about it. And she's ordinarily researching her own roots on her parents' side. Um, but she said, I'd like to take a look at this, see Marcellus if we can find Dodge, anything on yeah. Marcellus Dodge. The interesting thing that she found was there was a Marcellus Dodge, mm -hmm. who was the son, I believe it was the son, of Geraldine Dodge. Mm -hmm. Geraldine Dodge, for those of you who watch PBS TV, mm -hmm. uh, uh, periodically is credited as the, as the sponsor. Contributor, yeah. Mm -hmm. She is the one, they'll say the, this program was funded in part by the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, Foundation. or something mm -hmm. like that. I never met the woman. I don't know anything about that branch of the, of the mm -hmm. Dodge tribe. But apparently she had married into a Rockefeller mm -hmm. family, and, and the, uh, Mar Marcellus was, was their son. Yeah. And he had been killed in an automobile accident in France in the 1920s. 23, I think you told me at that time, yeah. And it turns out <coughs> that he was blonde-haired and blue-eyed and died at age 23, which is exactly what Marcellus would have been when I was 19 right, yeah. and ran into the lady in Missoula, Montana, who yeah. said she knew who I was because she had just met him. Just met him. I don't know if there's any connections there or not, but it's, it's an interesting... It's a wonderful story. It's a really, really interesting story. Yeah. Yeah, so you bagged your, 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 your brown bagged yeah. <laughs> your PhD, and you now became this photographer. I came back to the University <laughs> of Montana, and it was as expected. I had a much better position on the faculty because I was a PhD mm -hmm. rather than uh, holding merely a master's degree. Um, just to give you an idea, when you have just a master's degree, my room, which, which <laughs> yeah. was the faculty coffee room, yeah was my office was my <laughs> office so that meant that everybody came in there and had coffee and smoked cigarettes and gossiped using my office as the coffee room uh, because it had always been the coffee room but it was the only office room they had if i'd have had a phd they would have found me a private Different office nice office with curtains but, yeah. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing you get you know it's just it's yeah. subtle but it's important and so now i was back at the university with a phd and teaching and doing all right but the politics didn't get any better um, and, and then you had the lady at, at the post office, remember? Well, at, yeah. at, at the drugstore? At, at the drugstore. That, was, that had uh, already happened, oh, actually. Ha oh, I had I started see. the postcard business mm -hmm. uh, uh, earlier on, I before I got this new appointment. I, had, I was back at the University of Montana by 1973, but my postcard company I started in 71. And it was, soon became evident that I was going to have to do one or the other. Yeah. The postcard business was growing rapidly, uh, and I was becoming increasingly disaffected mm -hmm. with the way things were going at the University of Montana. Uh, so uh, ultimately, I quit the university and went on with the postcards. Now, um, you. Are